Hello everyone and welcome to the next in the series of the Make a Movie Project, which is all about camera shots. Now, if you've seen my other two videos, you will know how important camera shots are. These make or break the movie. They do so because they make it interesting or keeping the same one can make it a little bit boring. It's really important to change it when different things happen. For example, if you think of your favorite movie or your favorite part of a movie even, think about it and think what you like about it. Was it fun? Was it exciting? Was there action? Was it happy? Was it sad? Then what I want you to do is to watch this video and go and find that clip. And now find what are the different shots they used in it. Can you name them? So here are the different shots that we need you to learn for movie making. The first one is an establishing shot or a wide shot. And we have a few examples of it here. What it does is it shows us where we are, but it shows it from a bit away so that we get lots into the shot. We now know what location we're in, what type of weather we have, if we're inside or outside, if we're in, so an interior or an exterior shot, time of year, and even sometimes we get a kind of a feel for the atmosphere. If it's dark and it's raining and there's thunder and lightning, we know it's going to be probably something scary or it's tense. If the sun is shining, like in the first one, it feels like a holiday. It feels like it's a good thing that's going to happen. So we get a lot from establishing a wide shot, but it gives us an idea. If we move from scene to scene, it lets us know that we have moved as well. So it's a great shot to include every so often. Next one is then our mid shot. And we see a lot of different ones here. And a lot of mid shots are used for people. Some of them is someone by themselves. Other ones is more than one person. The bottom one where we have Barack Obama being interviewed. Obviously through it, what's good about it? Well, we see the background in it still. And in each picture, we do see some parts of the background. So that still plays a key part. We know if they're inside or outside, the weather and where they are. But we see more expression. So we get their body language in. We can see their faces for the most part. Look at the man doing the shot put. He seems to be under a lot of pressure and we can see that, but we see his whole body and we could see him even turn and throw like that. For Obama speaking, we see his hand in the air. So we have hand gestures, body language. Does he seem comfortable? Does he seem worried? The two women chatting, they're laughing. They seem very comfortable with each other. We could even go to now with the way things are. Are they social distancing? Are they keeping the two meters apart? The two jumping in the air. We get a shot of them. They're the main focus of it. They're the main part of that shot. But we get lots around them as well. So we can see they're either on the beach or they're near the water behind them. And again, the two guys throwing snowballs. We can see the snowball in the air. They're the main focus. But there's a car in the background and there's more again behind us. So that's a mid shot. It even takes kind of from our waist up but sometimes more depending. There are obviously different degrees of every shot. There could be a really long mid shot or a short mid shot. Next one is a close up, and this is the most obvious one for a lot of different close ups. You can have an extreme close up where it just goes in on my eye, or this is a close up on itself. This is my face. What does a close up do? It makes us focus on just one thing. We're not worried about anything else. We can see little bits in the background, but they're not clear to us like the rest are. And it shows us maybe tension. It shows that there's big detail. It shows maybe if something was broken, if something was perfect, if there was someone smiling, crying, angry. It's a great one for emotions and things like that. And it makes it a really dramatic shot. If I focus in, on my face while I'm talking. It makes it seem like it's more important. An over the shoulder shot is used when someone is looking at something else. We could do an over the shoulder shot from here going towards my computer now. It would show me working, me talking, and we could see what's on the computer screen as well. It gives you that feeling like you're behind the person. So if you look at each of these shots, we feel like we're the person one behind them again. For the goalkeeper, we feel like we're behind the goals watching the game. The person with the sheet, we feel like we're helping them. We're standing just behind them. So it makes us feel like we're part of the film, part of the movie, which is really important for the person watching 
to feel a part of it. If they do, they're going to enjoy it more because they feel it's for them. What does the over shoulder shot do? Well, the over the shoulder shot gives you a part of the person's face sometimes. We see that there's two people talking. We might get a reaction from them, we might see their mouth moving, but we're looking at the per other person to see how they're reacting maybe to the person talking, what they're doing. With the person with the sheet, maybe it's a checklist and they're focusing in on what they have to do. So we get a lot of information and we feel more a part of it as the person watching. Next is a Dutch angle. What a Dutch angle does is it comes from above or below, but it comes at an angle. It's not straight up or straight down because you wouldn't get a great shot. So we come in like this or like that. If we look at the dog, we imagine we're the person on top giving it to the dog. We are in charge. The dog is doing what we have. So we have all the power because we are on top of them. We feel much bigger than them and they feel small. The people walking towards us in the shot beside us, that's going downwards. And we feel that that's what we should be looking at, but all the buildings around them are so big, so they're kept small. Again, the girl with the foot up against the pillar. She's in charge, she has authority, She's a, so we're looking up to her. If you imagine Superman and the superheroes, they have their hands and their hips like this, and it's a power shot, and we look up towards them because we look up to our heroes. Same with the duck. The duck look, looks like it might attack us, or we could be in trouble. We don't feel comfortable because it's looking down on us and we feel like it could peck us at any stage. So that's a Dutch angle. It can show power or a struggle or someone in trouble. If you were doing one in the school and you were meant to be the teacher, you would use a Dutch angle looking down on the kids and they'd be sitting down and they'd be very worried like this if they're in trouble. So what type of shot is this? Hopefully you'll see it's an establishing shot. We have all of our location in it, and we have something to focus in on, which you'll see now. We have our two teddies, which we come into. The two teddies, this is a mid shot where we can see their body language. We focus on them, they're in the forefront, foreground of the picture, so they're the main thing we are looking at. Now, what is this? Well, these are two close up angles. We have a close up of the teddy by himself an extreme close-up of his face. We now go for the over-the-shoulder shot where we can see a part of the big teddy, mostly to the little teddy. Again, these are the Dutch angles. We're looking down at the, big, at the little teddy and looking up to the big one. A cutaway is the next shot I'm going to go to. This is a difficult one to explain sometimes, so sometimes you need to see examples. But, we take pictures of what's around us. If I'm outside, I've taken a picture of the daffodil behind the teddies. I could cut away to that in my movie and it could just fill in a blank for me. We could cut away when someone's talking to their hands like that. We still know we're there with them, but it fills it in if the two clips don't fit together. And I'll be showing you when we're doing our editing how we use them. Again, the bee on the plant, it's the same, it's to show we're outside, it's to, if we're changing locations, we could use something like that as the in-between bit. The hole could be used just to show this is my location, but it's a cutaway to the area. And the clock is a great one for the passing of time. We see it's, well, it's a little bit by half 12. If we did that, and then the next shot was the clock showing it, it was four o'clock, we could see that a few hours had passed and we didn't have to put anything in between. So here's an example of the teddy and the hat has been used as the cutaway. We can see it behind them and then we go from the other side and that's our cutaway shot. Now, pan and tilt, I'm going to show you what both of them are. So this is a pan where we move across the stage from one to the other. So you see what's happening. And we zoom in on that to show that's what we want to look at. So we move from one side to the other. It can build suspense where we don't know what's going on. And for this one, it's that Teddy's hat is gone. And a tilt shot, we come up, we come up, come up, and there he is with his hat on. Now, I'm sorry they're the wrong way around, but you can imagine that even if you tilt your head like this maybe, or turn the screen, you can see 
that we started it at the bottom. We didn't know what it was. And at the top, he had a hat on. If you imagine Cinderella in the Disney movie, when she changes from her poor rags and she spins and she spins and they do a tilt shot. And by the end of it, she has her tiara on and her hair is done and she has a beautiful dress on. So they build it up, goes round and round and round in a tilt shot. So there are those two. So what advice would I give you when using the different shots? For your camera, it's very important that your focus is locked. So you hold your finger in on the AEAF lock until you see it come up. Use the grid lines with your settings on the camera. Again, there's gonna be videos in a minute explaining to you why. Keep your lighting consistent. If it's too sunny, it's hard to see. And if it's too dark, it's also hard to see. So you're trying to look for the in-between. Stay out of shadows unless that's the, um, I suppose, the kind of, that's what you want. If you want shadows and that's what you're looking for, you're looking for that suspense, use them, great. But if not, if they're not meant to be there, try and stay out of them. Ensure the subjects can be seen in the camera. Look through the screen. Don't look above or below it. Try using different shots in the same picture or scene. Don't just say, oh, I'll just use a long shot. Maybe I'll try a long shot and a close-up and a mid shot and an over-the-shoulder shot for the same bit. Four different ones, and I can pick and choose the different parts whenever I want. You must be safe. I'm going to say this in every video. You must make sure you keep your camera in a safe place. You must make sure it's not going to fall. And you must make sure you are safe while filming. Don't think, oh, I'll climb this tree and it'll look really cool. Or maybe if I go down here to the bank of the river, I'm not going to go into the water. I'll just stay in the side of it. You have to be safe. It's not worth hurting yourself, someone else, or damaging your equipment. Stay away from windy locations. You could knock down your camera if it's too windy and it's very difficult to hear someone. If you're going to use a location that is windy or has a big echo, make sure you use a lot of close-up shots to the person talking so you can hear them well, or afterwards get rid of all the speech and do a voiceover where you replace it. Do not zoom. If you remember from the last video, what do you do? You zoom with your feet, you walk in and you move the camera to the place you want to bring it closer or bring it further out. And most of all, enjoy yourself. Have fun. This is a great life skill to know how to take a really good shot. So this is the task I'm giving you now. There's a list of the shots. Maybe if you wanna pause this and then go and take photos of each of the different ones. Use everything you have around you. Everyone in your class could be asked to take a photo of a chair. Does that mean every photo will look the same? No. Even if I said everyone used the exact same chair from school, would we all have the same angle, the same height, the same direction? No. So in that way, we are, can be creative. We can put our own mark on it. This is my photo of the chair. I could take a photo through the trees of the chair. That would look very different one in the classroom. I can move things around. I have two videos for you now that the Cooperative of Photography very nicely allowed me to show you. These are on YouTube. They're on this video here, but it's a great one to find any sort of tips on photography. So I really hope you enjoy it. And after you've done this, you can watch the videos before or after you've, taken your, uh, you've done your task, you've taken your shots. And once you've done that, start thinking, how can I bring this into my movie? Add it to your script, make your shot list, add it to your ideas, and away you go. Have great fun. And see you for the next video all about filming and editing.
Uh, photographing their own way and their own style. 